Okay, we're good. Good to see you all here again. It's great. I sort of close my eyes and like there's a few people here and close my eyes and open up again. Oh, there's more people here now. It's a, it's a whole like wall of people over there. It's great. <laughs> really good. So this is my technically second week in Seattle now. I'm really starting to feel like I, I've, I'm getting a bit of a handle on what Seattle's like. I, I saw an orca. So that was, uh, this is, this, the orca seems to be the, the great unifier of Seattle. As soon as you say, I saw an orca, everybody's like, wow, did you? And so yeah, it was, it was, that was one of the, that was one of the uh, great experiences that I had. I saw an orca, it came really close, really close to the boat I was on. So yeah, I'm, I'm understanding a lot more about Seattle now through whales. It's, Seattle people know a lot about whales. They're like, oh, do you know the minke whale in Australia? I'm like, I don't have a clue about whales. So uh, Australians, we know a lot about snakes. So, but Seattle people know a lot about whales. So there's a, there's a good world colliding here. So I thought, I thought this morning, um, I thought I'd start by asking a question. What do you think, what do you think about having many thoughts? If you're trying to practice meditation and you have a lot of thoughts, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? What's the general assumption, yeah? The mind thinks, yeah? 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 What about if there's just an over-spiraling and proliferation of thoughts? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Yeah? Right. And does anybody have a spiraling proliferation of thoughts happening at any one given point? Has, anyone, has that ever happened to anybody? Yep. That's, that's, so yeah, it's the, univ it's the universal of, I think there's a, there's, you know, we have an underlying assumption that when we practice meditation, we practice the Dhamma, what we're trying to go for is states of calm, states of stillness. But a lot of times we find ourselves overly assailed by thoughts. So what I actually wanted to talk about was a way that we can actually use thoughts to develop the calm and peace that we're actually wanting out of our meditation. And this is through a process that we call, uh, well, you know, in, it's, a very simple, it's a very simple term, it's called wisdom developing calm. And specifically what we want to try to think about is uh, a particular way that we develop a kind of wisdom. And that way is by developing a factor that we call Dhamma Vichaya, which is investigate, translates as investigation or contemplation of the Dhamma. Um, anybody that's familiar with the seven factors of enlightenment might know what Dhamma Vichaya is. It's this fact, factor where we contemplate the Dhamma in some way. Anybody that doesn't know what the seven factors of enlightenment are, they are these you could say seven very wholesome states of mind and things that we try to develop that allow the mind to become more and more liberated the more we experience these states. So the, these are the states of mindfulness, these are the states of uh, Dhamma Vichaya or investigation of the Dhamma, this is Virya, effort uh, and uh, rapture, pity, rapture and tranquility and uh, concentration, convergence, stillness, and uh, equanimity. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Dhamma Wichia today, this contemplation of the Dhamma, because it's, uh, it's a really important factor that maybe gets overlooked a little bit, or people don't really know what it, what it actually is. So what I'll talk about is I'll talk about you know, what exactly Dhamma Wichia is, why it's actually an important thing to develop, how you develop, and when you should uh, try to develop it. So for, to start with, you know, what actually is Dhamma Vichya? Again, it's translated as uh, investigation of the Dhamma. It's translated as you know, a way of contemplating the Dhamma, uh, analyzing states um, or, or, you know, or discerning uh, states of mind, discerning the Dhamma. And so what, what, do we actually, what do we actually investigate then? Well, 
the Buddha said that we use Dhamma Vichya to investigate our mind and our body, or what we call Nama Rupa. This is one of the ways in which we can develop uh, uh, Dhamma Vichya. Also, another way that the Buddha talked about was uh, investigating the states that we're actually experience, experiencing. And something very important to developing Dhamma Vichya or uh, investigation of the Dhamma is this thing that we call Yoniso Manasikara. Yoniso Manasikara is essentially, essentially wise reflection or wise contemplation. It's a way for us to actually see the world in some kind of way and see phenomena in some kind of way. And the Buddha talked about we develop wise reflection into our states of mind, noticing whether they're wholesome or they're unwholesome, whether our states are what he called blameable or blameless, which is you know sort of good or bad. Uh, he talked about uh, exalted or or like so higher states or lower states, uh, which is you know obviously exalted states of mind or more coarse states of mind. And then he talked about light states and dark states. So essentially, what uh, Dhamma Wichaya is is investigating these kinds of states that the mind and the body are in with wise reflection, with Yoniso Manasika. So Dhamma Vichya can be, can be investigating uh, the mind or the body, can be investigating states, and it can be a way for us to actually uh, investigate our experience. So why is something like this important? Why is it important for us to investigate our experience in this way? Well, if we think about Dhamma Vichya in terms of the other enlightenment factors, the enlightenment factors all go together. There's something that develop in unity. They're, iter they're iterative. They're interconnected in some way. So if you have, if you develop these other factors of the of the eightfold path, but also the factors of enlightenment, of mindfulness and especially right mindfulness and effort, right effort. If you develop these well, then you can actually develop uh, dhamma vichaya or investigating the dhamma in this kind of wise way. These things really, really go together. And obviously what most of us are wanting out of our meditation is these awesome, happy states of rapture, tranquility. We want the concentrated mind. We want the unified mind. We want these feelings of, of upeka. So we really need dhamma vichaya to actually develop these more exalted states, these states of the other factors of enlightenment that are, you could say they're essentially like the, the carrot, they're the things that sort of keep you going. If you don't have these states, it's like, well, why do I bother like sitting, like why do I wake up at four o'clock in the morning when it's dark and it's raining and everyone else is in bed and why do I sit here and do these things? It's because you can start to develop some of these joyous states and also a big thing that Dhamma Vichya can really do is to give you these kinds of breakthroughs and, and and clarifying uh, experiences and epiphanistic kind of experiences. So how do you actually develop it then? How do you develop Dhamma Vichaya? Well, it's, you might sort of think, well, give me a meditation technique to do and I'll develop Dhamma Vichaya. And it's not, we can get into that a little bit later, but it's not really like that. What it more is, is, is how you actually develop this, how you develop this, this faculty. And again, if we think about uh, Yoniso Manasikara, again, wise reflection, wise contemplation. We have Yoniso Manasikara, wise reflection, wise contemplation, but then we have Ayoniso Manasikara, you know, unwise reflection, unwise uh, uh, contemplation. And the way, so the way that we develop it is by develop uh, Dhamma Vichya is by developing this wise reflection. And if we develop it within the, in the grounds of also having right mindfulness and we have right effort as well, this is something that actually leads us to being very clear and systematic and logical in our thinking and reasonable in our thinking because, because we have this clarity of mindfulness there. We're investigating things in terms of the three characteristics of, of impermanence, uh, uh, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. We're seeing how things are connected in some way. We're seeing cause and effect. 
So we have Yoni So Manasikara, this wise reflection. We're doing this constantly. This is developing Dhammavichya in the right way. But if, we, if it's in the wrong way, if it's Ayoni So Manasikara or unwise reflection, things are scattered, things are all over the place, things are bouncing all around. And the reality is, is my mind usually is in the scattered and the bouncy kind of way. You probably notice by my hand gestures, I'm very sort of like, I bounce around a lot kind of thing. So it's a natural being, Ayoni So to some extent, uh, uh, to being sort of scattered and all over the place. It is sort of a part of our experience. So, but what we want to try to do is we want to try to be moving more and more into this wise reflection, wise contemplation, developing Dhamma Vichya in this kind of wise way. So, the next question comes about is like, how do we know then if we're, if we're, if we're enmeshed in wise reflection or how do we know then if we're in unwise reflection, how do we know if we have yoni soul or ayoni soul? How do you know if you're using dhamma vichaya or you're just scattered and lost in thought? And this is where I think the quality of the mind, the quality of the phenomenological experience actually really comes in and can give you a good indication of what this is. Having dhamma vichaya with, with wise reflection, there's a kind of power to it. There's a kind of momentum to it. There's a kind of solidity to it. There's a kind of, in a way, feeling like you're sort of locked in to this thing. You're investigating phenomena, but you're locked into it in some way. It has this strength that has this momentum there that the way I like to think about it, I think about it as this kind of metaphor you might be investigating some kind of Dhamma theme, so you think thought of something like impermanence, and you're investigating within that, you're investigating within the sphere of that. So it's like you're stuck in a whirlpool. Everyone seen a whirlpool? Yeah, everyone seen a whirlpool? It's like you're stuck in this whirlpool, and it might start going like really wide and round, but as you keep doing it and you keep investigating, you keep going, you keep spinning in it, it'll spiral down and you get closer and closer and closer in until you reach this point of convergence and it sort of sucks you under. And that's what, that's what Dhamma Vichaya using Yoni Soul should be like. It should be leading to this point where maybe it is very wide, but it sort of sucks you into this point of calm. Dhamma Vichaya done, done right will actually lead to these other enlightenment factors, as I said. So this aspect of sort of sucking you under, it's like sucking you under to the other enlightenment factors of, of uh, rapture, of tranquility, of concentration, of upeka. It sucks you under into the sea of calm, you could say. So Dhamma Vichya done right sort of has this focused and guiding power, even though it might be a little bit wider, so you're using your, your thoughts. Whereas if you're just sort of if you're trying to investigate in some kind of way and it's ayoniso or it's unwise reflection, it'll be sort of scattered. You'll be jumping around. You might think I, want in, think I want to investigate impermanence, but you might be jumping around all over the place. Oh, uh, you know, my body's impermanent. And also, you know, my, 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 my car registration is impermanent. Oh, I, I, actually, I've got to go pay my car registration next month. And oh, isn't it such a pain to pay car registration? Oh, but that's suffering. And the, 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 if it's going in that kind of way, it's not, it's not yoni so manasikara. You can, and so if we stick with the, if we stick with the water metaphor, a yoni so is like you're being thrown around in rapids. You've been in this massive tumultuous thing and you're getting smashed up against the rock. You're getting thrown around all over the place. So yoni so manasikara and dhamma vichaya, it'll have this power to it. This power that eventually might start out very, very wide, but it leads to a point of calm. Whereas if it's not wise, then things are bubbling all over the place. So the, the sort of the last question with this is, well, 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 when do you use this? You know, when do you use Dhamma Vichya? When do I try to develop wisdom? Or when do I try to develop some calm in the mind? It's sort of the... Um, it's, a, it's a very, very common question. Which one do I focus on? Do I focus on developing calm in the mind or do I focus on developing some kind of wisdom? 
um, do I do Samatha or do I do Vipassana? And the, the answer that I, that, I, that I, it's gonna be pretty obvious for anybody that knows me is that you actually, you need a balance between these things. When do you develop Dhamma Vichya? You know, when it is the right time to do it, that's when you actually do it. Like, if we remember what Dhamma Vichya is, it's one of the seven enlightenment factors. The seven enlightenment factors support each other. The, the development of right mindfulness and right effort and Dhamma Vichya actually leads to rapture. It leads to tranquility. It leads to samadhi. It leads to upeka. These things have to go together. Now, in saying that though, obviously we, we have a little bit of an intuitive sense of when is the right time to do this. You might feel at times it's like, well, I'm feeling sort of tumultuous at the moment. Maybe I just need to stay with the breath and keep my mind, keep my mind uh, calm just on one thing. You might have other times where it's like, well, maybe the mind isn't calming down uh, just by watching the breath. Maybe I do need to investigate the Dhamma in some kind of way. So we can use these factors skillfully. We can use Dhamma Vichya skillfully to round out our practice and to balance our practice out. It's not, these things aren't mutually exclusive. It's not like you should just do one or the other. You know, you have to do both. You have to be balanced and do both. To have a well-rounded practice, you do need to do both of these things. And you know the right time to do them because you'll, it, as I said, you'll intuitively feel these things. So the more we actually do this, you know, the calmer and calmer our mind will become. And the, there's a saying in the Thai forest tradition, you know, the more calm you develop, the more wisdom you'll develop. The more wisdom you get, the more calm the mind will become. So if we keep practicing in this way, you know, we'll just know intuitively, this is the time that I should be developing more Dhamma Vichaya, or this is the time that I should be moving more into these kinds of uh, calm states of mind. And again, I, you know, the reason I think Dhamma Vichaya is so important is it's be, I think it's good for, you know, people, people sort of like me that generally have a very active, very have, a, have a very active mind. This can be a way to corral the mind in when it doesn't want to cooperate. Most of the time my mind doesn't want to cooperate at all and just sort of goes off by itself. So this can be a very powerful way of sticking with some kind of Dharma theme to actually corral our mind in and, and to bring it in onto something. And again, it is so important because it is one of the enlightenment factors. This is the thing that is going to give you this kind of clarity into phenomena. This is the Dhamma Vichya is the thing that will give you this kind of epiphanistic experiences, these insights, these moments in your life where you go, I finally get it, or I finally see it. This is what developing Dhamma Vichya actually brings to you. So with that, I'll I'll leave you. I'll leave you with that, and that is probably enough of me talking. And we'll we'll sort of we'll we'll go from here. And if you want to do your thing, you can do your thing. Awesome. This is usually the point in the in the day where it's like the wheels come off. It's like, well, what do we do next? <laughs> what do we do now? It's... So uh, last week we did these kinds of breakout room things, and I like uh, I, I think they're cool. But like one thing one thing I'd like to do instead maybe is you know people ask me questions all the time, and I'm I'm sort of forever answering questions. So. I want to do it the other way around. I want to like ask you questions, some questions today. So I, I, for me, that's that's much more interesting. And I've got the microphone, so I can do what I want. <laughs> so, but yeah, obviously, a bit later we can you know have a bit you know, obviously be more of a discussion, and you can ask me some questions. But I just just as uh, you know, a question that might have come up in your mind while I was giving the talk was well, well. Okay, that's all well and good. I should have wise reflection and I should be investigating the Dhamma. But you know, what are some sort of practical techniques to do that? So 
does anybody have any useful ways that they can develop Dhammavichaya? Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, I find that for me, when my mind tends to go into darker states of like stress, anxiety, guilt, yep. worry, yep. Um, what I have done recently is mm. use loving kindness meditation right, right, to nice. get myself yeah. in a calmer state. Yep. Uh, sometimes I just stick to that yeah, nice. uh, during that uh, the moment of meditation because uh, sometimes it's sometimes it's really deep and yeah. I just need to give myself that loving kindness. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, it invokes a sense of calmness. Yep. And then later doing a meditation again later in the week or something, then I can begin to investigate those feelings. Nice. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good reflection because yeah, if you remember what I said um, that, that, uh, uh, that Dhamma Vichaya was, was our ability to wisely reflect on wholesome and unwholesome states. So it's good that you see that as you said, stress, anxiety, all these kinds of things. It's an unwholesome state, so you need to do something about it. And this is what we call putting in right effort. This is, this is where we've seen that there's an unwholesome state in the mind and we work out how to abandon it. And we uh, develop a way to uh, bring up a wholesome state in the mind. So that's, that's really good. Good stuff. Good work. You're further ahead than I was when I first started, so very good. Anybody else? Yeah, Steve, how do you stand up first? Uh, th thank you for this. Um, I, I, for me, the three characteristics are kind of baseline to my yep. practice. Yeah. So if I'm spinning out in some papancha ing in some way, mm. um, I'll just, I, I, what you said was really helpful because I just sort of, sort of say, oh, impermanence, mm. and mm. just identify it as that, and then shift it into identifying as that, and then it, it comes apart in the same with, I mean, it's just crazy how, it feels like 90% of the stuff that goes on in practice is also related to my selfing thing. Right. You know, right. how does, what does this mean to me or yeah. all that? And so yeah. when I get that yeah. reference to that, that, um, anatta mm. characteristic, it just takes it apart and dukkha too, because I sort of get obsessed with something, but it's like, ultimately it's just dukkha. So those three, I just feel like they just, they're like, they're like, uh, what am I trying to say? Swords that cut through. Right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's, what's necessarily wrong with identifying with something if that thing is wholesome? Well, I think, I mean, it's a good question. I think of it, if I concretize personal around it, that's the yeah. only yeah. problem. And then it becomes, you know, then it slips in the pride and all that sort of right. puffery. Yeah, yeah. Only that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess, I guess there is some kind of way where, where wholesome states can... A wholesome positive state can turn into an unwholesome positive state. So, yeah, there's the uh, you know, there's sort of the example. You, you said pride, you know, pride. So I was like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about. I had a good meditation. I feel pretty good about myself. My mind was calm. I'm pretty good meditator now. I got this. I got this worked <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm not with it now. It's like everybody else is all calm. I'm pretty good. So yeah. Yeah, so I guess there's, there are, we have to be careful of that as well, yeah? We have to really dis discern. Even the wholesome states can maybe turn into an unwholesome state. It's in the guise of a, of a positive state, so yeah. But yeah, I like that reflec a reflection of using the, using the three characteristics to, you know, as a, like some kind of sword to knock these out. Is there a downside to using the three characteristics? What could be a downside of using the three characteristics? I'll get back to you in a minute. Yeah, but can anybody think of a downside to the three characteristics? Yeah. I think if we um, take them as mine, then that would be dangerous. Yeah. What about what about say for example, if we think everything is impermanent, could that lead to apathy? Could that lead to inaction? I think that um, it could, but there would be other, um, that would be due to other unwholesome states of mind, like mm. Um, mm. Uh, sensual desire, ill will, and uh, sloth and torpor. Right, right. 
But well, what about what about sort of another thing that I'm sort of thinking about? What about what if we grasp dukkha wrong? What if we think, oh, everything's dukkha, everything's dukkha, everything's dukkha. everything's bad, everything's terrible, everything, <laughs> everything's everything's suffering, everything's painful. Is there a way that that can go wrong? It does for me. <laughs> yeah, you're going to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it can lead to nihilism, and it can also lead to uh, unwholesome actions as well. Right. So it's just like, well, if you know, why not do this thing that brings me sense, you know, like pleasure? Yeah. That's not good for me. Like drinking, I'll just mm. use that as an example. But like, yeah, mm. I mean, I'm just going to drink the night away just because everything's suffering anyway. Yep. So why not add to it? <laughs> it's all an existential pit. It's, yeah. it's all nothingness. <laughs> and what about, what's a way that no, non-self can go wrong? If it leads to um, you not being able to be blamed for anything, yeah. So the, there's a, there's a question of sort of moral responsibility there. Um, you know, who is the agent that's responsible if there is no agent? Like that's you know that's a that's an awesome problem and it's something I spend a lot of time a lot of time thinking and I don't have a good answer to it actually. So it's um it's a I think it's a very apt reflection. Um, anybody think of another way non-self can go wrong? Yeah? So. I can repeat it if you want as well. Yeah. Thank you. I would say um, a sense of kind of unwise disassociation from yeah. the mind and body. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just kind of seeing them separate yeah. and then not really having wisdom there. So yeah. just feeling you know, oh, I'm just a mind floating around inside this body, and yeah. you know, uh, it's more of a feeling. It's hard to describe, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's you've, you've touched on something pretty important there. That you know, it can sort of people obviously people have uh, experiences of depersonalization, derealization, where you know, from the outside, it, it looks like it might look like non-self. Might look like if you hear uh, 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 an instance of somebody that's having a, uh, 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 an experience of depersonalization, it's like that sounds great. Like that, I, I want to get that. It's like my my arm isn't real. Like my, you know, it's not it's not real. It's just it's not really a part of me. It's like that's what I'm trying to get, and uh, you're getting it. I'm not. So I, you know, there's there's something there of, of that. Even with the three characteristics, I think is we have to be very careful. How we approach them. You know, the Buddha gave the simile of um, grasping the teachings wrong, uh, grasping the basically grasping the tail of the snake as opposed to grasping the head. So we just, you know, we even in these, I think even in these uh, aspects where they are really useful, you know, we also have to be very careful. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the sort of the nihilism that comes from sort of no self, uh, sort of from from suffering. Um, or the you know maybe the apathy or something that comes from impermanence or the or the sense of no moral responsibility from non-self. I, I I think we just sort of have to be careful with these things about how we're approaching them and always sort of discerning: is my reflection of this dharma theme is it leading in the right way, or is it going in the wrong way? We just sort of have to be. I just think we have to be sort of. We have to be careful. We have to be careful with those kinds of things. So, yeah. Oh, and Zoom as well. Sorry. You're, sorry, you're behind a speaker. I can't see you. It's, yeah. Anybody on Zoom have a reflection? A couple of tools that um, mm. I was taught in terms of investigation yeah. were to pay attention to the sensations in the body, right. to note the sensations in yep. the body, and also to ask myself, is there a belief that goes along with this thought pattern? Right, right. So is that, is that uh, sorry, are you asking that? As part of investigation. As part of investigation, yeah. 
are there times that there's a feeling in the body that's pleasurable but then can bring up a negative mind state though? You think of a masochist or something. Mm. Like that might be a very, you know, very painful thing, but there's like a pleasurable mind state that's there. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's, are always the bodily signals the most you know, important? Or, you know, are they, you know, are they, you know, are they a good litmus test of what is good or what's or what's what's bad? I guess I think of it more as. I, I guess I think of it more as giving a little distance right. between the pain yeah. of that yeah, yeah. thought pattern yeah. and um, like ref reflecting about it from different positions, mm. like mm. what's going on in the body mm. and is there a belief associated with it gives mm. a little distance from the pain. Right, yeah. Yeah, I guess that, yeah, that's the important thing, the belief. The belief associated with the with the uh, with the sensation as well, and then yeah. and then is that belief true? Yeah, right. right. And you know, ninety nine percent of the time, the belief is not true. How do you know if a belief is true or not? Well, it's usually self referential. Hmm. You know. A, like a, a belief about myself, mm. for instance. Mm. Um, that that there would be evidence to the contrary. Right, yeah. Mm. Anybody else? That's a good question. Like, how do you know that a belief is true? Yeah? This is much more fun for me, by the way. It's, it's <laughs> One way is to follow it to its logical end, mm. act on it, and then see how it, what happens in the world if I act on it as if this was true. And often, if we follow beliefs to their logical end, we discover that they're not true because their effects in the world are deleterious or unskillful in some way. Yeah, because that, that could be dangerous, though. That could be quite yeah. dangerous. It's like, well, I have a belief, and I think the belief is right, so I'm going to go and act on the world in that belief. That could have some very detrimental. Yeah, <laughs> very, but that's how very, that's how we. I mean, and, yeah. and I'm I'm offering that as not yeah. not in a closed-minded yeah, way, yeah, but sure. with curiosity and with yeah. attention. Yeah. If I act on this belief, what are the effects in the world? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you know we just have to be very, as you said, we have to be very careful. Yeah. Careful with that. Like, so we have to be very careful with our beliefs because you know you're right you've touched on something there our beliefs usually lead to our actions our beliefs usually lead to a way that we're sort of like moving out into the world um you know look at you know look at me it's like you know, like look look what my beliefs end up doing to me it's like put me in these clothes and <laughs> so now i'm sort of like moving around in the world i got i got called gandhi the other morning it's Somebody, you know, Gandhi. Okay. So, what we believe trans can transfer into real life, and you know that, uh, you know, we just have sort of have to be. You're right. We have to be very, very careful. We have to be careful about that of what that action is actually leading to, because it becomes a reality. The belief that we have becomes a reality. So even if the belief wasn't true, our act of acting on that belief actually makes it a truth. We bring it into the world. We bring it into the world so it becomes a truth in some way. It might be erroneous, but it still becomes a reality. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, have to be, have to be very careful. Does anybody else have any other ideas? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Whole digital people, yeah. I, did, I, sorry, I can't see anybody's hands. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll jump to a zoom, a zoomy zoom. Yeah, Dante. Sorry, that's my Australianisms. Uh, I call things like zoomy zooms and the <laughs> and the YouTubies and the. Yeah. Dante, I just want to say I appreciate your sense of humor. But, I, but it's but going it, back to, going back to your original question. Yeah. What uh, what might one use to develop this Dharma Vichaya? Yeah. 
And for me, it seems to be insight meditation daily. Right. That's that's what's helped me. So is there a difference between insight meditation and Dhamma Vichaya? Hmm. What do you mean by insight meditation? Um, <laughs> well, that's where I'm meditating and I get to a calm state and I then am able to allow whatever arises, arise, like thoughts or emotions or, or whatever. And non-judgmentally, just notice them and witness them and observe them. Yeah. And uh, then these, you know, the insights can, can develop. They can, they can come on and, and right. I can uh, realize what, what's going on in my mind. So uh, again, I, I just wondered if, there, if there's any difference with that or Dhamma Vichaya. So I find it to yeah. be very helpful. Yeah. Insight meditation. For sure, for sure. It's, and it's good for that clarification. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap between developing a, a, like a style of insight meditation and Dhamma Vichya, because if we remember what Dhamma Vichya is, it, it's, it's contemplating the Dhamma, it's investigating the Dhamma, it's, it's analyzing our states, it's discerning our states, it's, it's uh, investigating into the nature of the body and the mind. So there's overlaps there. Um, but I think you know, something to keep in mind as well is how, how interconnected something like Dhamma Vichya is to the other factors of enlightenment as well. Of, again, right mindfulness uh, and right effort. And this, this aspect that Dhamma Vichya has within it of being able to discern what is wholesome and unwholesome what is uh, blameless and blameable, what is uh, uh, inferior and superior, what is light and dark, or essentially what is good and bad. So this ability to discern these different things in some kind of way, I think it's, it's a very important part because I think there's sometimes, I think there's sometimes with the, with, the, with the common understanding of what insight meditation is, is like you just let everything like be as it is. And that's helpful sometimes, but then it's also helpful sometimes to go, well, like we were saying before, it's like, how do I actually, if there's something that's not so good, how do I change that into something that's uh, uh, helpful and useful and wholesome? So they have a, they have a massive overlap. So insight, insight meditation and developing Dhamma Vichy have a massive overlap. You could say, you know, they're, they're pretty on the, on the, what's it called? The, the Venn diagram of, of, of Dhamma Vichya and insight meditation, they probably overlap quite a lot. But wh whenever you get into constructs, you know, if the more you sort of pass them apart, you do so notice some little differences there. But yeah, I think way more similarities than there are differences. So, yeah. Thank you, Bhante. No problem. There's one more. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, Regarding the, the question of whether or not um, a belief is wrong, mm. um, something that I've been doing, I call it Google Earthing, where right. I'll zoom my, myself out. Right. Because when, when I'm stuck on a belief, I have right now an acquaintance and I are having a difference of opinion on something. Mm. And I find if I just pull myself out and look at us from above, like the two of us, yep. then I can go, oh, I can see right. where my view is problematic. Right, and that's right. been something that's kind of been helpful to do. Nice. Sort of pale, pale blue dotting it, Carl, Sag Carl Saganing it. And <laughs> is, that, exactly. is that what you sort of mean by that? Or is it, is it your sort of, or your like thinking of the, per like the person and, 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 and you as well? Or is it like really, really zooming out? I find that when I'm attached to a thought or an idea or belief, Yep. It's because I'm here in myself, in my head. Right. But which is when, you know how when you zoom all the way in on, on Google Map? Yep. So you can you can actually see um, a, a building really close. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. I can zoom all the way out instead and see the whole 
geography of a, a state. Yeah. If I do that with my mind and I'm looking at the two of us, for example, yeah. and then I can then I can say, oh, I can see now what's going on, why we're having maybe a difference of opinion because right. of some thoughts in myself that are right. unhealthy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that well. No, enough. no, I get it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think that's that's quite helpful. It's um, it's um, it's something that I've I've sort of tried to use a lot of uh, as well, but but more in the in the pale blue dot sense of like this thing that I'm thinking is sort of insignificant. Is this massively insignificant? It doesn't really matter that much, but you know that can you know that can sort of lead to um, uh, for me it leads to kind of a sense of ease about that. But you know some people can be be terrifying. But does it lead to a sense of of ease for you? And, a, and an ability to let it go, or is it, or can it go astray? It allows me to see. Uh, I, I'm kind of referring to when I'm having a, di a difference of opinion right. with someone, yeah, okay. or yeah. difficulty with someone. Yep. It allows me to um, watch the relationship from afar instead of being stuck within myself. Right. And then it can, I can catch myself if I'm doing things that are um, not beneficial. Yep. And I can change course. So for me, it's really helpful. Nice, good stuff. I believe you had you had a technique as well. I uh, yeah. Didn't get to you. You did put your hand up ages That's ago. Quite all right. Yeah. I um, was reacting to your question about what do you do when you've got thoughts intruding. Yeah. And I was really aware that um, this morning I had that happen. Right. And I found a solution that is sometimes useful. Yeah. There was an incident that occurred at the door. Um, right. Somebody was here who was not part of what we normally do. Okay. And um, it, he was p brought to my attention and some remarks about him, and I kind of assessed the situation. Mm. And he, he was leaving. Yeah. Then he came back in. And he was asking, do we have blankets here? Right. Uh, did we have a, uh, a gift card? Right. And I felt very uncomfortable at the time having yeah. to tell him no. Yeah. And, and not knowing what to do. And, um, and, and then he left again. Mm. Sitting on the cushion, you were talking about if, if you have a difficulty or um, a pain yeah. occurring. Yeah. And that struck me. Mm. And I re recalled the difficulty in my own feelings at mm. the door. And then I just let it play by right. its, as it would. And this whole series of things slowly came. Mm. Gary, you could have invited him over to have mm. a cup of coffee. Mm. You could have shown him the food and asked him if he wanted something. Mm. You could have shown him to a chair over here by the many tables mm. we have. Mm. Just give him a place mm. to quietly um, quietly eat and rest yep. in where it's relatively warm and it's dry. Mm. You could have asked your colleagues who know these books over here better than you do um, what might be an interesting thing for him to mm. be given mm. to occupy his mind, especially if he's not familiar with yeah. any of what we do. Yeah. And what would it have been like for him to just sit here quietly and relax yeah. while we all meditated and enjoyed this experience mm. that we have every Saturday. Mm. All those things occurred to me and I had had this difficult feeling of guilt standing at the door mm. by the time I came to the end of that right. whole train. Yeah. What occurred was a very calm sense that the next time I'm the greeter at the door, yeah. I think I might know what to do. Yeah, nice. This so is, that was this what is, came yeah. When I was trying to think about my mm. breath. <laughs> yeah. No, and th this actually brings up a, like, a, something that I'm really interested in is like sometimes the positive power of a negative emotion, like guilt. Like guilt can be useful. Um, guilt can be something that's useful. Obviously, you know, as part of Buddhism, what we're doing is trying to abandon negative states in the mind. But sometimes they're useful. 
because we can learn from them. Obviously, we don't want to sort of spiral down into guilt and sort of, you know, you don't want to be for the next three years sort of you know, racking your brain about these kinds of things. But there are some, there is some utility in some of these, in some of these, uh, what are seen as more negative states. So, yeah, I think it's, it also shows, it shows an element of Dhammavichya within it because Dhammavichya is, is investigating some kind of uh, wholesome or unwholesome state wisely. And that's what you're doing. It's an unwholesome state and you're investigating it wisely. And you're trying to change it into a wholesome state. And so there is this kind of negative state there and this negative state sort of propels us to do something good. Propels us to investigate it in some kind of way where we can change this into something that is a lot more positive. So, yeah, I, there's a lot of times what we try to do is we try to run away from any kind of negative mind states that we have. But sometimes I think we can use them. But, but as long as we, you know, as long as we tread, tread carefully. Yes, I have a history of being completely crushed by guilt. And yeah, yeah. in this case, fortunately, I was able to just recognize what it was, the discomfort, yep. and let myself go into it. Nice. And, and it, it resolved. Nice. So. Yeah, good. It's good. You, you learned your lesson. It's very good. <laughs> Did, there was another question? Oh, one there. Pulled. Where? Online? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, go ahead online. Is that Iris? No? Somebody else had their hand up. Mary? Morning, Bonte. Good morning, everyone. Hi. My question takes it a little bit different turn, and I don't know if you are open for that, because yep. it is more of a question than... Um, so in the meditation, Bhante, you had yep. mentioned the peace in pain. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about that throughout this whole discussion. By the way, I really appreciate everybody's contributions and what was said. Very helpful. So how does that apply to pain? Does one look into the pain? I mean, I, I do investigate pain in terms of... Um, you know, we're prone to aging. And is there is the piece that you were talking about in pain, the acknowledgement that this is the way of the body? Ante? What does it what does it mean for you? Well, you know, there is this thing that we've all been circling around that once you see the phenomena, you can um there's a piece with it, you can accept it, you can include it in your equanimity. Right. Yeah. So does, I mean, there is that piece of knowing this is the pain. Mm. This is the, um, you know, understanding the cause and the effects, understanding how the body's taking it up. There's still pain, but one carries it just a little bit differently. Right. And I'm wondering if that's what you meant. I mean, there is in the middle of the knowing itself mm. is a piece of peace, isn't it? The yeah. knowing itself is the peace. So do we place that knowing in the middle of the pain and, and just observe that effect on it? I'm going to do something that's going to annoy you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to answer it because what you take out of that is useful for you. If I give you an interpretation of that, then you're going to go his interpretation, that's what he meant. That's the interpretation. That's the right interpretation. I'd rather you sit with it and figure out what it means for yourself. Okay. I think that's more helpful if we if you if you did find that useful reflecting on it yourself a lot more and finding out what it means for yourself that's I think that's a lot more important like I can tell you a hundred things and you know it's uh, it doesn't mean as much to you as 
figuring something like this out for yourself and taking some kind of meaning of this for yourself. And I'm not being flippant with the question. I have my interpretation of what that is. But I think the real power in it comes from how you will interpret it and you will use it. So, so sorry, I'm not going to quite answer the question, but I hope, I, hope, I hope me not answering the question leads to a better understanding of it than, than me just actually answering it and giving you an, uh, an interpretation. Is that fair? That's more than fair. Okay. That's more than fair. It's my experience. Good. It's my practice. It's good. my, it's my, yeah, yeah. It's and good. I also think that um, we skirted around it in all the, uh, in all the different conversations. So I appreciate right. everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Bonte. And thanks for reminding me because I forgot I said it. So that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> we are going to have to call it call it a day. We've sort of gone a little bit over time. Anybody that wants to ask me any more questions, you're more than welcome after that. Yeah? Sorry. Um, we has about the belief thing. Um, yeah. So when when I believe that I believe was like in the right way yep. and then and then I had a question to myself mm. and it seemed to trouble me because um it's made me lose lose who I am or or like keep questioning myself and I don't know like um is it just leads me to some not a good place or keep questioning myself and and it seems like it's it's troubling um things up and how to get out of it, things like that. So do you mean you question the belief or you question the truth of the belief so much it leads to a negative place? Is that what you're trying yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, there's something about, there's something that you have to, you have to sort of see if something's going in the right direction or not. Mm -hmm. If something's leading to, 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 to calm a mm -hmm. lot more. If this kind of questioning your belief is leading to developing more of the enlightenment factors, these more of this joy of like, oh, hang on, I'm mm -hmm. just, I've broken through a belief, I've broken through a, a sense of identity. This brings this sense of joy, this sense of rapture, then that's, mm -hmm. that's something that's moving in the right direction. But if you're questioning these things and they're leading to these kind of darker states, if you remember what Dhammavichaya is, is like uh, uh, discerning between wholesome and unwholesome, dark and light states, uh, uh, exalted and inferior states. If we know that our doubting these beliefs or questioning these beliefs is leading into more of those darker ones, then we have to go, okay, we're, we're going on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. You could say, in a Buddhist sense, that's wrong effort because you're allowing yourself to... to move into unwholesome mind states. So we just have to be careful. If, you, if this method of inquiry is leading to more of those negative states, you should pull, should pull back from it. Um, and that's, that's usually the caveat I give with before I give most talks of like, if you try these things and they don't work for you and it leads to a negative state, just don't do them. Like, just, like don't listen to me. Like, like, for the love of God, don't listen to me. Uh, if, if it's leading that, like, don't do it. You have to, you have to know for yourself if this thing is going to work for you or not. And if it's not working for you, yeah, just, just pull back from it. Pull back from it. Try to develop something else. Maybe try to reaffirm a useful belief. You know, I have a useful belief that that being kind and generous to people, this is going to improve my life. Focus on that belief instead of focusing on the. Is everything meaningless in life? Focus on the beliefs that you know that will be helpful and useful to you. So you have to sort of change the change the scope of what you're you're, you're focusing towards. So, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, and um, I just wonder how to taste it, like how to taste that belief is true. Yeah, it's. Hmm. I mean, I can ask people, but I need to understand it myself in a way too. Yeah. That's. It's a hard question, and if you come and talk to me, talk to me later, and we'll maybe answer it because we are sort of, we are like out of time, unfortunately. But yeah, I will, I don't, I will, I will actually answer it.